Over the years that we've held the ABSARD meetings, we've had repeated feedback that one of the most fun and enjoyable and informative parts of the meeting is a chance to talk to experts about how they handle complex situations, cases that are not written about in the literature or for which there are no real great evidence-based trials. Because as you all know, evidence-based trials tend to be very selective and we can't be selective in clinical practice. We have to see whoever can comes to see us and sort things out. So let me just introduce our panel to be sure that if you haven't already met them. Um, so immediately to my, my left is, is, is Dr. David Goodman from Hopkins, a world-renowned expert in adult ADHD. We've got Dr. Mary Salanto, who's been moving around New York to different programs, is now at uh, NYU and who is a world expert in adult uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Next to her, needing no introductions, uh, Dr. Len Adler, uh, also from NYU, and Dr. Richard Gallagher. We've got an NYU uh, heavy panel here. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Jim McCracken from UCLA and myself, uh, and I guess I sort of switch hit because I see kids and adolescents and adults, uh, and I'm Tony Rostain from Penn. I'm sorry, I have to ask about uh, cases in general, and this question's about uh, the evaluation. So I get a lot of um, referrals from primary care for evaluation of adult ADHD. And right now, in the waiting room, I give them the adult symptom report scale. They come in and I ask them more about symptoms and rule out anxiety and other things. Um, but I was wondering if you'd recommend any other approaches or different approach? Thanks. So suggestions around how to go about, that's a very good opening question. How do we go about evaluating? What are some important pearls for what we need to do to evaluate the complaint? Of, what kind of a practice are you in? Adult outpatient psychiatry practice. Okay, tools we should be using and uh, strategies for the assessment. So go ahead, Dr. Goodman, you want to start? Okay. So uh, I, I suspect any of your questions could go to any one of the panelists and they could spend the next hour um, on their discourse. Uh, my basic evaluation is 90 minutes. The um, person comes in and usually because I'm known for ADHD, they say, oh, I, I'm having problems focusing and concentrating and, and I say, fine. Um, and before I launch into all of the symptoms, I, I start, I go backwards, I was trained to to do this backwards, so I go to medical history, I go to medications, uh, uh, caffeine, you know, remember to do all the things that you might not remember to do, caffeine, supplements, vitamins, herbs, all that kind of stuff, um, because about 50%, 60% of these folks are, are already or have already used complementary and alternative medicines. Then go through the psychiatric history, and I will say, when were you first evaluated for educational or mental health reasons? Psychiatrists are trained to say, well, when was the first time you saw a therapist or mental health? But actually, you want to start in the education stuff first and then come forward. Um, and then I go through my psychosocial history. And the reason I do that is I want a flavor for this person. How do, they, how do you convey your story? And am I going to detect any of the negative consequences of ADHD through the course of your story? What's your driving history between the ages of 16 and 25? The other aspect about interviewing for me, and, and everybody here has, has seen hundreds or thousands of patients, and so we all know what we're doing. But I, I break this out into two categories. One is get the subjective list of symptoms from the patient developmentally. So um, grades five, six, seven, then what would those symptoms look like in high school? What did those symptoms look in your first job or college? What did those symptoms look? So I'm tracking these symptoms. Now on top of that though, at each developmental phase, I'm asking whether there was an outside informant or an outside um, observer that changed their behavior towards the patient. So in school, I say, did teachers move you to the front of the class because they, they thought you weren't paying attention? Did they move you to the back of the class because you were being too disruptive? And as you go through school, you get to school. Um, when they're driving, I say, how are you as a driver? And they say, fine. And I say, well, that's interesting. Are people nervous riding with you when you're the driver, and they say, well, funny you should ask, whenever I go out, my friends don't let me drive. So, so I'm looking for an outside observer who's actually responding to the person, so there's an observation that this person is a bit peculiar. In college, I'll say, did friends identify you as, as being kind of disorganized and scattered and showing up late for every party? And they'd say, oh yeah, my nickname was. And, and so that helps just the specificity, and then I kind of move forward. 
having ruled out all of the other comorbidities. And you really want to rule them all out, social anxiety, panic, ritualistic behavior, hypomania, depression, uh, postpartum depression, premenstrual mood changes, um, and, and all of those things. Uh, trauma, did you play sports? Were there, was there repetitive concussive injuries? That's, that, those are, so, so that's how you do a comprehensive history. This idea about symptom checklists and come in and verify, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think that people will check off a symptom uh, checklist in your waiting room, come in, you ask three or four questions in the course of 10 minutes, and make a decision. And, and unfortunately, I'm involved in, in cases where um, primary care docs in 15 minutes, that's what they do, and they write a prescription for a stimulant, and that's how the diagnosis gets made. And, and that's, no one up here would endorse that's the way to do it. So I'll stop there, but that's my, that's how I do an evaluation. Did you want to add anything? Um, I just, uh, I do a second session to spend more time on the developmental history. So after finding about current symptoms and impairment and in the context of the patient's current life situation and responsibility, I'll spend some additional time where I'm entertaining alternate hypotheses about whether or not this could be due to anxiety or depression. And during the developmental history, look, uh, ascertain carefully the social, emotional, academic, behavioral um, functioning of the child at each developmental stage to look at possible precursors of anxiety or depression that may help to um, explain the current um, profile of symptoms and impairment. Uh, so let me be a little different. Um, let me commend you for using a scale. Um, Scales aren't shortcuts, but they are meant to provide information in a somewhat structured way, which you then can use and explore. Um, it's an information gathering experience. So um, using scales in clinical practice, I think, can be quite helpful. Nothing for ADHD replaces the careful longitudinal history. There are no shortcuts. Um, if you have the if you're using the World Health Screener, um, the six items psychometrically handles better than the 18 um, in terms of being predictive of the disorder, but you should never, never, never make a diagnosis based on six questions or 18 questions. Um, but if you have a patient that you're handing this out in the waiting room, they screen positive, you then go through, get the full 18, which is meant to do a symptom inventory. That can provide a roadmap for you to explore current symptomatology and impairments. And the impairments are critical because having the symptoms is not adequate in terms of making the adult diagnosis. It really requires impairment. And you have to take that developmental history. Um, you have to go back. You have to go look in childhood. And in DSM-5, look for multidimensional presentation of adults of childhood symptoms. Um, and the, the, when taking the history, you will see the roots of the disorder in childhood. The, the threads will run through. Um, if you want to be more structured, there are a number of scales that are formal diagnostic scales that you can use that provide prompts and uh, ways to frame the questions. Um, on the NYU Mass General Scale, the prompts that are used in DSM-5 are kind of lifted out of our scale. But scale's not available in clinical practice. It's really a research tool. Um, but those prompts are available as mar married into some of the symptom scales that are out there um, and that are distributed. So um, I do think taking, you know, nothing replaces taking that careful history. But I do think that symptoms uh, inventories can be really helpful in establishing the breadth of symptoms and then allow you to assess impairment. Let me just add one other, the issue of collateral information. Yeah, I didn't and we, adult psychiatrists are incredibly naive about this. They think that they can diagnose a disorder just by talking to the patient. And being a child psychiatrist and a pediatrician, my view has always been, until you know the family and what's going on and hear from what's happening, you don't have a full picture because patients will either, either over or underestimate both symptoms and impairments and the consequences of past whatever events, whether they were life events, relationship issues. 
uh, what happened to them when they transitioned, especially. So I actually do a lot of asking about st supports and what, who was helping you survive, then what happened when you moved out of that realm, that sort of scaffolding you had in high school. A lot of our patients come to us at Penn messing up when they leave to go to college or to go off to their first job. And so getting collateral information though is also important from the per side from the point of view of worries about um, either malingering or pseudo ADD or people who are making up the, the uh, you know the looking for stimulants. Okay, so I do think you have to have some way to get validation from outside of the patient, and that we say it very constructively to the patient. We always say, look, we we know what your story. We're glad we got in your story. Now we need to have extra some other eyes on the situation. So we'll insist on the other report forms, both current and, and, uh, and uh, Barclays uh, scale of other and past childhood um, reports, childhood symptoms. So let me add to that because it, it, as, as you hear everybody tell you how they conduct the interview, it becomes um, really much more complex than yeah. what, what you initially think about. Eighty percent of my folks that get a diagnosis have an outside informant. And so primary care docs, I mean, we have more time than primary care docs, and primary care docs say, well, you know, I'd love to do all of that, but how do I do that in a time-efficient fashion? I do, the, I do use the ASRS, the 18 items self-report scale, at baseline for the patient, as well as I give them a ADHDRS of childhood symptoms so they can reflect on their symptoms at that point. Then I send home a copy of the childhood symptoms to a mother who can provide the historical information if parents are deceased or not involved, then we give it to a spouse or a sibling who can give at least the chronicity of symptoms over time. The ASRS, actually, I find to be very useful and time efficient in regards to tracking the target symptoms and to see how the frequency of those symptoms change as you institute your medication changes. Often patients don't remember uh, what they filled out at baseline, and it's very helpful when you, when you show them the improvement. They go, oh, I, I really had no idea that the, that the improvement was that that much. And then you track that over the course of time, especially if you're changing your doses or changing your medications. You have a longitudinal course of, of your ASRSs over the course of different medication changes. Yeah, just to echo that, we, so we use the BDI, like because I'm at Penn, Beck, the, the Beck Depression and Beck Anxiety, and now we have the ASRS for everybody to use for both screening and for following, following up symptoms, the uh, very helpful tool. It's quick, patients like it. And you do see symptom improvement over time with treatment. Okay, everybody, thanks for your attention. And please, please tell your friends about this organization, fill out the forms, and hope to see you next year at our meeting. Take care.